Hello and welcome. If you saw my Ape Reels Reparathon, you maybe remember this Gigabyte GA486VF mainboard. It had some physical damage, the keyboard controller was defective, and the mainboard didn't boot as soon as any cache was installed. I could partially fix the issues, but didn't have enough time back then to solve all of them. However, I promised to come back to this mainboard and make further analysis. And here I am. Eventually I found some time to revisit this board once again, so let's see how it turned out. If you didn't see the last video about this board, maybe it's worth it to watch that one first. Anyway, if you remember, the broken keyboard controller was the LT38C41L, and I tried to replace it with another supposedly compatible ICs, but they all didn't work, except the LT38C41, which I borrowed from another board. There was obviously something different about that controller and why the others didn't want to work here. So after a while I found some time to take a closer look at the main board again and already after a couple of minutes I was surprised how blind I was when I tried to get it running in the first time. As I looked at the socket for the controller once again I noticed this soldered jumper JP32 which clearly says keyboard clock 14.3 MHz or some AT clock. The jumper was obviously hard set to AT clock. And if I think about it for more than 3 seconds, I realize that the issues I observed previously could have something to do with the wrong clock. If you maybe remember, the keyboard was half working, with all kind of different glitches, and that behavior could be due to wrong timing indeed. And I really don't believe I could be so blind. But, well, an usual 40-pin keyboard controller is fed by a frequency of 14.318 MHz from external oscillator. Probably the LT38C41 expects some other frequency, which is marked here as AT clock. And indeed, the AT clock named frequency, which I measured on the pin 3 of the jumper JP32, was about 7.1 MHz, half of what is usually used. And as you see on the pin 1 of the same jumper, there were about 14.3 MHz indeed. Such lack of attention didn't happen for the first time to me, so here comes a really serious advice to all of you out there who is struggling to repair something like this. If something doesn't want to be fixed today, just don't stress it and put it aside. The next day you will be maybe less tired or more lucky, whatever, but you will maybe get a better chance to crack the nut. I have a special box where I put all the hardware into which is to be repaired, and all the stuff where I seem to stuck also goes into that box. It already happened many times that something was just lying there for longer, and I had no clue how to fix that. And then I suddenly somehow knew where I have to look, like in this case. So eventually I switched the jumper JP32 from position 23 to position 12 inserted one of my controllers from the spare parts, connected everything and voila, the keyboard worked like charm. Also the num lock and the other keys. That was quite a simple fix eventually. Now let's talk about the second issue. This mainboard froze right before booting the operation system every time when cache sockets were populated. So I used my logic probe once again to see if all the cache addresses and data lines are showing some signs of life. And everything looked good, until I came up to this pin. As you see, no LEDs were lighting up, no low, no high, nothing. This means that this pin must be completely disconnected. As I explained in the previous video, the DIP32 cache sockets, which are used on this mainboard, can either take DIP32 128K SRAM chips or DIP28 64KB SRAM chips. The smaller ones have to be inserted at the end of the socket to work properly. The pin, which seems here to be not working, must be pin 2 on the IC. Let's see what it does. The fourth pin in the socket means the second pin in the IC, since it is shorter by two pins. So the pin 2 is one of the address lines and simply can't be dead. There was obviously something bad with the board. All of the address lines are interconnected between all of the cache ICs in the block. So also the suspicious pin should have a connection to all the sockets above and below. 
This unfortunately wasn't the case. The upper two sockets have had a connection between them, as well as the two lower sockets were connected. However, there seemed to be a break somewhere between the second and the third cache socket. So I took a closer look and found a broken trace inside of the socket. Can you see it? Since there were other physical damages on this board, which I fixed in the previous part, that wasn't a surprise. Probably another PCB was thrown at this main board and it hit it right through the socket. You can even see this scratch on the plastic as well. Probably this comes from the same hit. So I removed the two lower cache sockets to get a better view on the damage. And luckily only one trace seemed to be damaged and I could see it now and even measure that there was no continuity. Just as I showed in the other videos of the Repairathon, I again used a Dremel to polish away the solder mask and get to the copper. Then I tinted the traces and soldered a piece of wire to bridge the broken trace. I could make a botch wire on the backside, but I prefer this way if possible, since it just looks better and it is not as easy to rip off as a normal botch wire. After a short continuity test, I again covered this port with a drop of nail varnish, just to keep it from oxidation. The varnish was not necessary though, since the socket above the port will protect it from any physical influence anyway. After the dip sockets were soldered back in place, I checked the related pins for continuity once again. Here how it looks like now. You can see it only if you know about this fix. A short power up of the main board and measuring with the logic probe once again showed that there was now some activity on the related pin indeed. For the test, I used the same 9 cache ICs, which I was trying to use in the last video. 8 times 32 k main cache ICs and 1 32 k tag. By the way, in the last video there were some questions and suggestions regarding the tag chip and if it has to be a special one. No. All those ICs are the same static RAM chips. Some manufacturers did use a different chip for the tech, but only because of economical and not technical reasons. And as I already explained, the DIP28 cache ICs can be used in the longer DIP32 sockets. They just have to be inserted in the end of the socket, so the upper two pairs are left open. Okay, here I already added a graphics card and IDE controller with a pre-installed MS-DOS on a compact flash card and I also upgraded the system to 8 MB of RAM. After some configuration in the BIOS, the system booted properly. It detected 256 KB of cache and started to boot into DOS. It didn't hang anymore, so the broken trace was the issue indeed. In SpeedSys throughput tests there were now two steps clearly visible, one at 8k of level 1 cache and another one at 256k of level 2 cache. The overall throughput performance was within normal limits for a DX266, which was running here. Cache check also reported 256kb of level 2 cache. I left the system running for some time and it didn't show any issues. All the tests ran stable and showed reasonable performance. In Doom it made 2688 real ticks, which corresponds to about 27 FPS, and absolutely playable value. Well, and this is it. In the last video I fixed some physical damage like ripped off transistors, and in this video I could address the two issues which I left over from the last time, the keyboard controller and the cache. The keyboard controller is now fully working, it was just a question of frequency supplied to the controller. I still can't believe that I was so blind the first time and didn't realize that there is a jumper. But eventually this board works now with any controller from my spares box and doesn't need the LT38C41 which it came with from the factory. The cache is now also completely working, and it was just a broken trace. It was very unfortunate that the board was hit by something right inside of the socket, so the damage was uneasy to see. But maybe you see once again how useful such a logic probe can be. Well, and all in all, the main board is fully working. It is fast, it supports 3 volt CPUs, it has VLB slots for a fast graphics card, it will serve as a very nice base for some retro build in the future. And this is it from me for this time, I hope you enjoyed this video and say thank you and goodbye.